Good afternoon. Welcome. Uh, James from Community Legal Centre's Queensland here. Um, welcome to one of our webinars, this one looking at trauma-informed practice and resilient lawyering, um, drawing on the experience of no more legal service. Could I begin this session by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands on which we meet across Queensland, across um, Australia, in fact, with uh, a lot of interest from community legal centres um, workers to hear more about this work. Um, I acknowledge elders, ancestors of First Australians across the country um, and welcome any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are joining us today. Um, and also acknowledge the great work that No More has done in working with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander clients. It's um, an impressive element of their service that you'll hear more about, the level of engagement um, and the number of clients with whom they work, which of course reflects their over-representation of victims and survivors in this space, which is um, a great national shame. Um, a couple of housekeeping things before I hand over to Anne and Amanda. Um, we're hoping to record this session. We also emailed out a copy of the PowerPoint presentation an hour or two ago to everyone who'd registered at that stage. You should also be able to download or access the PowerPoint from the handouts section on the um, go to webinar control panel thing that you've got there. And we'll email around another copy uh, after the presentation with a link to the recording as long as everything goes well. There are a couple of ways that you can ask questions. You can type a question into the questions box on your GoToWebinar control panel. Or you can press that button that looks like a hand. At our end, we'll see something that looks like you putting up your hand. We'll be able to unmute your microphone and you'll be able to talk um, directly through your phone or your computer microphone. They're the housekeeping things. With that, can I hand over to Anne Gummo, the senior lawyer, and Amanda Whelan, um, the team leader of, um, of the social work crew at No More. Um, no More is, as they'll tell you, a specialist service for people um, considering engaging in the Royal Commission. Um, they're doing incredibly important work, uh, terrific work, and based on their experiences, I think they've got a lot to share with others in the community legal sector, including looking at trauma-informed practice and resilient lawyering. Over to you. Thanks, James. Um, my voice is Anne. And, and this is Amanda. And uh, I'll just reiterate James's um, acknowledgement to country. I won't go through it again, but um, I think that one of the big learnings for us in this has been a marvellous opportunity to learn and work with um, so many, um, not just individual Indigenous people, but also to go out onto community and um, keep learning. Um, I'm. I was, my background, I've been at No More since the Brisbane office started in uh, the beginning of 2014, but prior to that I was uh, worked part-time at Women's Legal Service here in Brisbane for about 23 years. And I think a lot of what we used to do at Women's, and presumably they still do, was trauma-informed practice, but we didn't ever have the words to put around it um, in the way that we do now. Amanda, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, I'm Amanda Wheel, and I'm the team leader for the support services team at No More, which incorporates the social work and counselling work as part of No More's multidisciplinary model. Um, I've worked as a social worker for 19 years. Um, most of that's been working with um, victims of uh, trauma and abuse. Um, and I started with No More in January of 2015. Prior to that, I was working with other victims and survivors um, at Lotus Place and started when the Royal Commission started in that work as well. So um, it's been great to join No More and also to, um, I think, and I've spoken to some of you via this web, uh, webinar process earlier in the year and I continue to be a massive fan of the CLC sector and feel very privileged to have joined you all. Um, just initially, um, a lot of a lot of what we do is, um, well, everything we do basically is grounded in the experience of, of the people with whom we work. And um, when I was doing a little bit of research to find out sort of how when No More was being set up and, and how how that you know, it came to be set up with the partic as partic specifically as a trauma informed um, service delivery uh, on a, on a, that sort of a model, um, I was chatting to James and he he sort of put it really neatly when he said that this is yet another example of CLCs learning from their client group. Um, today we're really going to focus, normally we would talk client related things, but you know, as you can see by the title of this um, webinar, we need to look after ourselves to be able to look after our clients. There is a, an awful lot of material that has been written and um, we've put links to, to quite a number of that 
but you know it's something that people have to sort of work out what works for them. The next um, the next PowerPoint will just uh, set out how we're going to set out this um, webinar today. Just just briefly, no more was set up um, when the Royal Commission was announced. The NACLEC lobbied the um, federal government and um, sort of to get you know, to set up a legal service so that people could have legal advice before speaking to the Royal Commission. Um, and it, you know, I think to their eternal credit the, and hard work, NACLEC sort of could articulate the really important need for, that, for, for having a legal service. This uh, need wasn't always recognised by the, either the Royal Commission or the government, but it has proved to be um, highly successful and I think all the commissioners of the Royal Commission now acknowledge what an enormous difference it's made. We were set up to have a multidisciplinary model and we have um, a legal team. We have a team of Aboriginal, Torres Strait Islander and South Sea Islander engagement officers and we have a team of social workers and counsellors in addition to the sort of backup admin people that make it all possible. Um, we have a website that's got a lot of information, so if you're interested in more information about No More itself, yeah, you just um, click on the link. Just briefly, I thought before before um, Amanda will talk more about trauma-informed practice, the, the model that was used when No More was set up was trauma-informed. It was person-centred and, and there was a lot of work went into making, ensuring that it was cult a culturally secure place for um, and framework so that very vulnerable client groups uh, could feel supported and the, it also uh, you know, acknowledged their complex needs in a way that was reflected in the actual establishment of the service. And it's important to acknowledge here that NOMA was actually well resourced by the Attorney General's Department to do this and having worked in the CLC sector on and off since 1981, the um, I understand that's a rarity, but I do think it's worth always putting in part of funding submissions that you actually have the ability to meet our clients where they are. The only other thing was in relation to the multidisciplinary services that we offer. We, um, you know, we have learned from everybody that we've dealt with, and I think that that's sort of the thing about having a trauma-informed model is that it, it has to keep growing. There isn't a one-size-fits-all and there's not one way that sort of stays the same all the time. There are some stats there on another um, slide which I don't intend to go into. So Amanda, if you wanted to go into that part two, is it trauma-informed practice? Yes, sure. Thanks, thanks Anne. Um, and I know that lots of people will be, you know, it's pretty hard to exist in this area um, of human service and, you know, community legal work these days and not have heard trauma-informed practice, trauma-informed approaches. There's lots of language around that and lots of uh, focus on it. Um, so what we're looking at today really is just, I guess, how we've conceptualised that within the No More context. Um, we, we, when we say what does trauma-informed practice mean, what we want to do is recognise that there is an enduring impact when it comes to complex trauma for people. Um, and what, what we don't ever want to do is pathologise the people that we support. Um, and it's, it's really, um, really important not to do that and, and that, you know, to understand that um, it's got a recovery-oriented approach, I guess, as well, that people can move in and out of wellness and that recovery is really possible. Um, the big thing for us is, you know, an approach that doesn't say, hey, what's wrong with that person but says what has happened to them. And when you take that point of curiosity about a person's history instead of, what's going on with a day-to-day -day reaction and response and quite often you will find that, you know, it really shifts your whole engagement, I think. Um, it's also about understanding and particularly for no more because of the content matter that we work with that triggers can occur at any stage in a process and you don't always know what those things will be. Some people can sail beautifully through something, others can be immensely impacted um, by something which may seem minor um, to others. Um, the, um, we, we want to acknowledge um, the Blue Knot organisation and they um, were previously called ASCA, Adult Surviving Child Abuse, um, and they put together the practice guidelines which have been widely accepted across Australia about trauma-informed practice. I'm sure that everyone's familiar with their material. If they're not, there's a link there. 
but the key principles of trauma-informed practice are, um, and it's really important to think about these not in terms of just how you work with clients, but also about how how you are within your teams, within your organisation. Um, and it's the notion of safety. So how do you create a sense of safety? And that might be physical safety, but it might also be emotional safety, um, cultural safety, absolutely. Um, the notion of trustworthiness for no more. We are working with a group of people who are highly, highly, um, you know, mistrustful and rightfully so of institutions and organisations. And so that for us is a really important um, thing to consider at all times. Um, you know, if someone calls, and, you know, if you say you're going to call someone, make sure you call them. You know, the trust is you know, it takes a long time to build and, and is broken very quickly, we often find, especially for our cohort. Um, to give people choice, um, to work with them in a way that is collaborative and, you know, to in, to empower um, rather than, you know, control. yeah, control <laughs> and stand over. Um, and I guess that, you know, we're really saying, you know, that, that when you when you implement trauma informed practice that you have to consider it at all at you know I guess I guess um, it's got to be embedded in everything that you do. One one of the things I think we notice with even though our, our sort of client cohort is specifically um, have suffered childhood trauma, I think um, most people who practice in poverty law, as we used to call it, which is the CLC sector. Most people are there because of some sort of trauma, and I think that even though ours is much more um, obvious, it's, it's still across, across the board of the whole CLC, CLC sector that so many of our clients have suffered previous trauma, which, you know, if you would approach it from that perspective, um, explains a lot of sometimes the people that are present with really difficult behaviours, so there's often a really good reason why that is. And I think that that goes really well with you know those questions that we have there. We agreed that today that because Anne's got such a wealth of um, knowledge, and I always love um, asking her questions and seeing what comes out. So one of them was definitely about you know why is trauma informed practice so important to the CLC sector, and I think you've kind of spoken about some of that there, Anne. Um, I think as well that it's really about um, wanting to make sure that because people are often, you know, so um, disengaged from community, society, and services as a result often of how they behave. So, um, yeah, it often helps helps in that regard too. And I think this goes on to the next slide as well. But in the sense of, um, it's really important that it crosses all sections of, of your organisation because if it's just a service, if it's not a trauma-informed trauma, trauma informed organisation, if you just have trauma-informed service delivery and then come home and treat each other poorly or that you think it's okay to not come home so much as go back to work or if you think it's okay to tick a box that yes, we've done ASCA training and be, um, you know, we make sure that everyone puts 15 minute break every five hours on their timesheet whether or not they did or not, you know, that's not trauma-informed. It's got to be something that is part and parcel of the whole ethos of an organisation. So when we, um, so we're just going to yeah, change slides now. Um, so I guess some of the questions that we often ask or we looked at was, you know, why, why trauma-informed practice? Why did we look at that um, as part of No More's model? And I think um, one of the things that, um, you know, um, that we were, you know, was very clear early on in um, in how No More came to be was also consulting with survivor groups and their, um, you know, really firm position that, that a trauma-informed model was what they felt would work best for them. Um, as I said before, that it, as an approach is recognised as leading best practice in Australia and across the world, really, in working with victims and survivors. Um, also, because it was being extensively implemented across the Royal Commission processes and all of the other funded services, it made a lot of sense for us to, you know, make sure that people were having a consistent approach to how they were supported through those things. Um, and one, one of the things that we did, you know, I think we could have been our little mission statement was do no further harm. And I think that that's not, you know, that I think we can all live with that because you know, most of the people we have things to do with have been very damaged. And it's surprisingly hard to do. It is. Yeah. <laughs> because it can be so 
so um, unwittingly triggering yeah. to even just to raise the issue or things that you don't even are aren't even on your radar. Um, you know, for example, the colour of clothing you're wearing or <laughs> that sort of thing yeah. it can it can be anything. And so you sort of constant learning. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, you know, I guess because No More's core business is working with victims and survivors of child sexual abuse, it was inevitable that we would be regularly talking about highly traumatic material and, um, and it was important that we had a model that cared for our clients and also for our staff. Um, so how did we implement that um, and, and I guess implement it and continue to sustain it? It was built into our model and our structure, as you know, Anne talked about earlier. Um, it's also in our HR and recruitment processes, so we make sure we talk about trauma-informed approaches in our advertising. It's part of selection criteria when we interview people. We ask questions around that and who we, I guess, you know, what we value in people is not so much, um, you know, it's, it's got, I guess the kind of work they've done and working with victims and survivors and having an understanding of that rather than, um, you know, just necessarily a long impressive um, resume in that other way. Um, we do have compulsory professional development for all staff when they commence with No More and some of that includes um, uh, trauma-informed uh, training that Blue Knot organisation provides. I've put a link there to their workshop booklet. They do specific workshops for working within a legal context, so if anyone's interested they could um, have a look at those as well. Um, I think what you'll get from those is the really core um, information that you need, I guess. Um, how you implement it then becomes an issue for any service or worker. Um, we also have um, an integrated reflective practice framework um, and and the, um, the, I guess what that, in terms of features of that, which lots of places will have, but for us it is individual and group supervision, um, regular professional development opportunities for people. Um, we're pretty big on team meetings and um, and the importance of you know, coming together no matter how busy you are. Last year we get together as a group of a couple of the staff in No More. Um, which is a really fantastic opportunity to connect and share what we're doing. And we also have an employee assistance program available. Most places will know of those, um, but it's just about accessing counselling if there's issues coming up for you. Our group supervision is um, we um, access one of the experts in, in trauma trauma reform work through the Blue Knot Foundation in Brisbane is, is a psychiatrist and he comes to us for a couple of hours a month. And if people want a one-on-one -on -one session with him, they will sit with him um, and, and sort of discuss where they need to. But at least an hour of a two-hour block, but often more, is um, we just all sit and chat. It might be that we um, email him a couple of days before saying, you know, we wouldn't mind talking about if someone had an associated with identity disorder, you know, who are we getting our instructions from? <laughs> How do we know what's important or what's the difference between a sociopath and a psychopath and how's the best way to counter that? And it's just been a really, it's been a growing thing. I'm not sure he'd done much group of supervision before, but it's been a, a really a marvellous way for us all to learn and just have an opportunity to talk about those sort of really tricky things that you only usually think about when the client's sitting in front of you. And he brings really good cake, like <laughs> really good cake. And um, yeah, that always, um, seems to help where nothing else will. Can I go back a step? It's James here. Mm -hmm. Sorry to jump in. No, and there will be a lot of lawyers on the line who understand supervision as kind of a management thing. So my supervisor looks after oh, me. I think okay. the concept of supervision is foreign to some lawyers. I wonder if you could just right, talk a little yeah. bit about, and I don't know whether that's best addressed to Amanda or Anne, but talk about that concept of supervision in a social work or counselling sense is different to what we understand to be in kind of a managerial legal practice sense sometimes. I'll start that and Amanda can correct me. Because <laughs> okay. as a lawyer, you know, and because women's always had a social worker, I've worked with social workers really for most of my legal career, which to, to my eternal benefit. But they, um, social workers as part of their routine employment would have a regular supervision with an external senior social worker that 
is their opportunity to put stuff on the table and work out about was this the best response or what should I do? And Amanda can expand on that because mm. I know I've never done it. <laughs> but what what we sort of our version of supervision in this is, is not in the sense of any sort of disciplinary or managerial sense. It's in the sense of um, being able to work out the best way to practice or to deal with the problem or, or to share. You know, this worked then, but it didn't work then. What else should I have done? And it's just a marvelous opportunity to to sort of enrich your practice and to uh, really make sure that everyone's getting their best bang for their buck, really, the yeah. best use of your time. Supervision um, in that context, and people get that sort of line management support through Anne about their legal practice, and that you know that sits in there as well. This is really, I guess, a space for you as an individual person to process you in the work and I guess that's, uh, you know, whether it might be skills development, it might also be being able to talk privately about, you know, some of the impact, um, you know, how you're tracking outside of work as well, you know, make sure that things are travelling okay. Um, yeah, it's really just a, a kind of like a checks and balance and a personal support process as much as anything, um, driven by your work. But if it's, you know, if that's then identifying big bigger issues for you, then that's when you would look to also use the employee assistance program. Yeah. And then some some circumstances it would be that an individual thing as well, depending what the issues are. That's right. So that might lead us into the next slide if that's okay, James, because I just wanted to um, just make sure, because I know that um, Michelle Leering, her, she's presented at um, CLCs before in Australia. She's based in Ontario in Canada and I've been so fortunate to be able to work alongside her developing No More's model because I came across her her work and it was just amazing. So there's a link there if you haven't had a chance to read Michelle's work. She's doing a PhD in this at the moment and um, it is just, I think, fantastic for talking about all the ways that you truly integrate, you know, reflection and, and the benefits for, for lawyers in doing so. And, um, yeah, supervision is a tool in that. And I think for, for a lot of my work, or a lot of my experience too, is that integration is really important because I, I think you can't be one, you can't have a bit of you that doesn't link or, or connect to the other bits of you without causing some sort of problem further down the track. And and I think that you know that you really are the same person at work and at home, and you know as a as a professional and as a work colleague and and things like that. And I th I think it's sort of Doing this sort of stuff is, is a really good way. Um, I think it's a really good way to protect against burnout. I think you, you learn to know what your reactions are, and, and I think if you sort of can actually reflect, now why did I react that way when this client did X or a colleague did Y? That if you can actually sort of reflect back and thinking, what is it about me? What what button did that press, and why? Um, will improve not only your professional life but I think it improves your life overall and that the fact that it is integrated I think is crucial because once you start getting this integration it's a pretty slippery slope. Okay. Is that better? Okay. So if we um we just you know uh, the, you know so I guess what we're saying is really when the rubber hits road and it's all great in theory and you can have beautiful policies and you can write these great documents but you know how do you really, it's got to be embedded in culture as well. Um, so my question to Anne is, um, and you know for others I'm sure out there to think about it, so what role does leadership play in supporting trauma informed practice and self care? We sort of talked a lot about this and, and we were talking in preparation for this about the difference between being a manager and a leader and that the management stuff is really quite separate and I think that there's a leadership role for everyone and to sort of lead from where you are and when we go on to talk about the resilient stuff, you know, I think we all have a leadership responsibility in relation to caring for our colleagues and, and, and observing, you know, often when you as an individual, or maybe I'm just projecting me as an individual, <laughs> when I'm sort of not travelling too well, you often are sort of keep blustering on and thinking it's all okay, but it's much more useful, you know, other people can observe there's some changes or something. And I think that part of, you know, being working together and working in, in a way that is sort of is really healthy and trauma informed is, is to be a leader for other people, you know, for everybody and to, to watch and everyone has some responsibility. And, you know, I think leadership is crucial and it's all part of 
this is how it looks in your culture, and this is it's also how we all, um, you know, really work together. And, and, and you know, I'm a big believer in working collaboratively, collaboratively, and sort of a few brains are better than one. Anne's a great advocate for us organisationally as well as a team. There's times when she'll manage things up that we, you know, that, that works beautifully well. She leads by example. She's very open. We feel we can approach her and she doesn't ask anything of us that she wouldn't do herself. And, you know, that for me is, you know, it's all a big part of it and it's okay to say you're not okay. I think we might have someone, um, one of our participants who might have something to say about this. Antoinette, are you there? I've just unmuted your microphone. You put your hand yeah, up. I don't, you I'm, no, I don't. I'm not sure why it keeps raising its hand on my computer. I keep no, trying I, to put it down. I can hear from you anyway. Uh, <laughs> hello anyway. <laughs> okay. Um, can I just ask, sorry, Annie, answer that in a fairly kind of abstract way about the importance of leadership. Yeah. Practically, how does that manifest itself for your team here in Brisbane or across the entire organisation? What are some of the kind of positive leadership actions that people take to embed this culture? Oh, where to start? I think it, one of the things is sort of modelling to each other ways to behave and ways, you know, like I think trying to, to call things out whether, you know, to actually name things that if, if it's not working um, and doing it in a way that is constructive rather than um, ratcheting up a problem. I think modelling and behaviour, you know, like making sure that I do go out of the office, that I, um, I'm only meant to work four days, not that I'm particularly good at that, but, um, you know, I go try to get to yoga every week, I try to, you know, I take my mother-in-law shopping. But I, it's like, I know they're really pitifully good examples, but I think what it is is that we're all, we're, I mean, this is part of the integration bit. I think we have also that there's um, a real feeling. Uh, and we're all spread a bit thin at the moment and all a bit stressed and hanging out for Christmas, but usually <laughs> we, <laughs> there's, there's a really feeling of openness. Um, what else do you notice? You're much better at articulating that than I am. Uh, um, I think that... Um yeah, okay, and, and and makes it really okay. It's not, um, you know, she'll also manage our workloads, like help us with workloads and things like that. There's no expectation that, like, you know, it's not about, okay, be really great with the clients and then just log yourself to death. And, you know, I think that that's, you know, that's really important too. And, um, yeah, she's an honest, straight-up person. I think, you know, when I think about the trauma-informed principles, you know, safety and trust, to the first two and I feel that and you know does that really beautifully for us you know we feel safe enough to say if we're not okay and you know we have a great sense of trust in her and she has an incredibly collaborative style as well it's a very inclusive style which is we all feel we can have a say and she highly values the multidisciplinary model which is really important. We also have a drawer full of chocolates. <laughs> <laughs> Which segues beautifully into talking about impacts of the work. Um, I, the re, I, um, I had a lot of fun with the title of this slide because when we were working with um, a woman called Robin Brady that we'll talk about shortly, but uh, basically she said, you know, that um, you, you will inevitably be impacted as a consequence of being an empathic being unless you are a psychopath. So we sort of thought, okay, well, there's some good news there. You're not, you know, if, you, if you're feeling the impact of the work, there's, you know, that's, that's a good sign. Um, so we just basically saying that working safely with survivors of trauma involves accepting that the work is emotionally strenuous, and it's a really, it's an unavoidable risk. You can minimise it and all the rest of it, and it's not. It, there's nothing. There's nothing wrong in being impacted. It's really about how you move in and out of that, and you know, recognizing it. Yeah, and you know, call the signs early, reach out to your colleagues, all those kinds of things. There's a great link there. There's a 2007 article by Zoe Morrison. Um, it said that was a quite a foundational article around the, the, the notion of VT and um, feeling heavy. So if you want to look at that as well. Um, and if we can yeah, move on there. But, um, one of the things that we've really, you know, come to realise is those deliberate acts of harm by one human against another are often the ones that really, you know, 
tend to, to weigh pretty heavily. Um, as we said, it's a normal consequence, you know, of being impacted is, is, you know, of being an empathic being. There can be a real sense of, you know, soldier on with codril, I think, at times in this work. And that's, you know, we try not to, you know, wear a badge of honour. You know, it's okay to be impacted. Like, what does it say about you if you're not, really? Um, you're a psychopath, there you go. <laughs> um, the notion that teams catch the moves of their clients and they catch the impacts of their colleagues, um, which is something that Robin has said to us before and I think for me sits really beautifully. Um, you can often find yourself mimicking the, you know, the behaviours or the, um, and, and you can see it in your colleagues as well and it is, it is catching. Um, that link there is to an article by Robin Brady called The Resilient Lawyer. Robin is a social worker in, in Sydney and uh, at our last couple of um, all-star get-togethers, she's actually spoken to us and um, we had one in, was that only October? Recently, yeah. anyway. And um, she started, and was sort of talking about vicarious trauma and things and she sort of starts off saying, you know, listing a whole lot of the, um, uh, of the sort of symptoms and things you get, you know, that it's... Um, and every, you could see everybody <laughs> nodding their heads as, as it went through. But the, the type of things that, um, you know, some of the signs, and well, we'll see with that later, but some of the signs in relation to, um, you know, say sort of depression that you might get in, uh, are things like um, you sort of all the things that used to give you pleasure no longer give you pleasure. You be, can become overly critical of yourself and others. You can feel tired all the time. You can, your thought patterns can become disorganised. You trouble being organised. Takes you longer to do things that normally than it normally would. You make silly mistakes that you would never normally make. You know, even like mixing up. And you know, we've got had this massive influx of prison clients, and so we just sort of see like the rest of our staff today are at Woodford Prison, and they would have been seeing sort of six and seven people back to back, and you, you forget the name of who you're talking to, and all these things that you would never otherwise do. Yeah, that's everyone else. Thankfully, I'm not exhibiting any of those symptoms, so that's, that's really good. Good luck with that. Yeah. yeah. Um, but, you know, and I think if we ask for a show of hands, which we won't, but, you know, I'm sure we could all identify with that at any at any given time. I think, you know, a lot of those things is that sort of the more empathetic you are, then the greater the risk. And, and the fact that it's cumulative, it's the fact that you, you, can, you, you can sort of get it from each other as well. Yeah. But one, one of the things that I took home from Robin Brady and that whole article is that um, it's much worse if you're isolated or unsupported and that it, it's, you know, the things, and this probably leads on to the next slide, does it? Yeah. Oh, no, I probably don't be here, so I'll go, well, we'll do that when we get to it. But I, I think the sort of the problems, you know, there are physical risks and, and, you know, I think that they're probably well documented in the sense of, increased risk of diabetes, heart, kidney, pancreas and gut problems, arthritis, sleep disorders and then psychological things like cynicism, anxiety, depression, over or under reacting and this all can get compounded by um, self-medication with drugs, alcohol, sex, gambling, whatever it is for you. So, you know, I think it's a really, it's really good to be aware of it because I think once you're aware you can at least look for signs and, and yourself and each other. Hmm. So um, with all with all of that, we also thought, you know, and I guess that's again why when we when we outlined the trauma informed approach, I guess that those items that Anne just identified really highlight, you know, the importance of being aware of the work, the the impact, and you know, also too because if you are like that, you're highly unlikely to be able to help the clients that you know that um, need you to help them in the best way possible. Um, and this is where we're sort of saying, you know, we are actually our own, you know, we are the instrument of our work, you know, whether it's lawyers, social workers, whoever, you know, you are your own tool in this essence and, you know, like if you're an elite athlete, you've got to stay match fit and, you know, this is really the same, this is staying match fit in, in the context that we're working with and, you know, we use that analogy of the oxygen mask falling from the plane and, you know, and people will have heard that before, but it's really important is just, you know, really are you going to be able to help anyone else and, you, you know, look after yourself first. That, you know, staying in the work, staying well in the work looks different for everybody and we'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute. 
Um, there's also some really great resources that the Queensland Law Society has got on their web page and there's a link there to those as well. Um, I've been able to have a look at those before and um, some of what I really love is because I was really fascinated by lawyers and working with them when I first started at NOMA because I had not said anymore. No. <laughs> <laughs> I feel fascinated, <laughs> perhaps less curious. Um, but you know, great stuff around the culture of lawyers as well, because I really had to learn a lot about that because it's such a different work culture. Um, and you know, with social workers, it's ingrained in us that you know, be reflective, be open, talk about this, you know, talk about work-life balance and all those things. And it was really quite, a, you know, quite a different different experience. So uh, I'd really encourage you to have a look at those. There's also information there on supports that you can get through Queensland Law Society as well. Amanda couldn't believe how lawyers could argue with each other and agree to disagree and things like that because social workers always try to reach a consensus and come out with an Oh, it's awful. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. People can just like plough on into an argument and it's just and then done and dusted and it's great. Right. And then it's over, yeah. So, um, so we wanted to focus back some more again on some of the work of Robin Brady and as Anne spoke about before there's a link to her paper again there and um, really she unpacks beautifully you know the neuroplasticity of the brain and looks at you know those impacts of you know the hormones which we haven't had time to go into today but at, you know the Why? physiological you know chemical reactions that happen to working with you know with, with traumatized people and stress over time um, and it's a really fantastic read because I think it really helps you to understand your own kind of mental health and that as well it, it's an easy read too like she doesn't write in a, in a in a way that's inaccessible to mere lawyers who don't know the jargon you know it's, 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 she's got a wonderful style yeah um, and it, you know, we just were saying, you know, what do we mean by resilience? Um, you know, and it comes from that notion, I guess, of being able to jump or leap back. Um, you know, which is the ability to recover and, and you know, recover from or adjust easily to adversity, misfortune, or change. And that's really easy to say in a sentence. But you know, when we talked before, so I think the thing for me is, you know, we're not flatliners. You know, that that means you're dead. Like you can't just travel exactly the same all the time. You're going to go up and down and move in and out of your own wellness. Um, and that's the same as, you know, there's a notion within recovery models which says we're all in recovery. And I really like that. You know, the notion that everybody has their own journey with, you know, just being okay or not okay on any given day. And it's not about separating us out from, from our clients in that way in particular. Um, there's some things there that um, you know, can really promote resilience, um, staying connected to the bigger picture. And what are you kind of... Look, the, ones that, the one that really... I started work at Women's Legal Service in 1990 and left in 2013, but in, you know, sort of... In the early days, I spent over that time. I spent a lot of time thinking about what was it about women's that we didn't have the sort of massive turnover of staff that a lot of DLCs and community community organisations generally had. We didn't implode like a lot of particularly women's organisations did. And I sort of thought a lot about it over the years. And you know, what I, I came to the thing that what kept women's sort of consistently punching above its weight, so to speak, was that everyone was headed in the same direction, everyone had the same vision, everyone, there was no one had their own agendas, that we, we really were. And I think that staying connected to the bigger picture, you know, why am I doing this and, you know, what makes it worthwhile, I think is incredibly important. You know, and I think that it, it's, um, mm. it sounds a bit trite when it's written like that, but I, I think you have to keep reminding us while we're, reminding ourselves while we're, why we're here. One of the things that we were reflecting on the other day, you know, being part of the machinery of something like the Royal Commission and, you know, is that our role in essence and the Commission's role is to bear witness. It is to bear witness to the stories of the survivors and what we're not really going to do much witnessing of is the change that will come. And, you know, that will come but it might be five or ten years down the track. That being said, we also have to remind ourselves there's been, we've started to see some things like changes in the statute of limitations here in Queensland, you know, a redress scheme for, has been announced. You know, those things you've really got to hold on to the successes and the change that you see as well. And I think that's 
you know, that's kind of like why, why did we do this? And the same as for survivors, they need to know well, what did I come forward for? You know, is it going to make it better for other kids? Yeah. You know, they they need to see those. You know, they they need to have that you know sense of the bigger picture as well. And it's tremendously rewarding giving people a voice who have never had a voice, mm. and and that's not confined to survivors of child sexual abuse or survivors of domestic violence or 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 anything like that. I think it's it's just even people that have never had an even break, and that's in my experience a lot of a lot of the CLT clientele. It's enormously rewarding to sort of see them move differently and sit up straight and actually feel that they can do something. And, you know, I think that's why we do it. And um, I think I've said to you, uh, to those, any of what, anyone who's listening, um, the last webinar that I was talking at with Warren Strange, but you know, I've been in the big room with you guys at a conference last year, and you know that that's a mighty feeling, and you know that sense of you know common purpose, and you know not not agreement necessarily, but I just you know I think there's there's a lot that you know like it really um, was quite um, powerful for me to see you know. The, the common calling, I guess, that exists for lawyers in the CLC sector. Um, you know, we also just moving through that now, looking at, you know, it's important to have supportive relationships in work and outside. Um, and also too, because through those relationships, they're often the people, the first people that are able to say to you, hey, you know, are, are you all right? Um, well, there's also there about a break from certain kinds of matters so that you can recharge, you know, um, it, you know, are you able to, you know, take on a slightly different role for a while or, you know, um, move, move away from, you know, some component of the work and do something else for a bit, you know, that, that stuff's really, really important. So moving on to sort of the other sort of things that a workplace can do, um, there's a list of things there, but, you know, I think there are other things like sort of you know, managing conflict, and there, there was a quote in her paper, Robert Brady's paper, that sort of said, in a sense, it's not the rupture, it's the lack of repair. And I think it's really important that, you know, that conflict is, you know, is sort of called out for what it is right at the beginning. I think it's not helpful for it, for it to be, I mean, to a point, you'll see if it blows away, but I think it's really important that there just isn't this underlying feeling of conflict, because that just... That, that in itself is contagious and it impacts on everybody. And I think, you know, the work the work's too hard for that as well, you know. Like I think you when can't you're fight on all front. No, <laughs> when you know, if you're out doing the work that everybody's doing, there's incredibly challenging work that everybody's doing every day and then if you come back and then you team all your organisations at each other and it feels awful. And we've all been in those teams and organisations. Um, you know, like that's it's a pretty lonely place to be. Um, so, you know, it's really important that, you know, the workplace recognises and validates impacts. Um, you know, we talked before about the importance of providing supervision mentoring. I understand that lawyers often access mentoring as well. Is that right, Jane? They probably prefer to call it mentoring than supervision. <laughs> yeah, that's probably right. Yeah. And um, Robin spoke recently about the immense, you know, the great value of mentoring, and she said often too, you get more value in providing mentoring than you do in receiving it. Um, and we the mentor, not the mentee. That, that, that's right. <laughs> I might just jump in with a plug there. We'll be relaunching our mentoring program in the next month or two. So oh, Queensland CLT lawyers, yep. think about getting involved either as a mentor or um, if you're looking for a more senior person to provide you with some kind of stuff. Um, our pilot evaluation thing was released earlier in the year and showed just what a valuable resource that is. Fantastic. And that, that you know, that's really... You know, that's really validating and I think because, you know, often too when you're mentoring someone and, you know, I've supervised social work students and things like that, because often the questions of people that are, you know, perhaps in a more active learning phase can really help you to think about your work differently too. And, and remind the world you're Yeah, yeah you know, agree. and there's an enthusiasm and a, you know, a curiosity yeah. that you sort of think, gosh, I'm old and burnt out, I need to get on to that. <laughs> yeah. Um, Celebrating skills and successes, like you know, it's 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 inevitable that our priority is always to talk about when stuff went wrong or there was a problem or whatever, and you know that's important. But you really need to you know hang your hat when you get a victory too, and you know, and they can be few and far between in the work. Yeah, um, you going? <laughs> and to value the work, the worker, and the client. Um, and you know, I've I've come across many people. 
um, over the years I've worked in teams and organisations sadly too where you know highly value your client group um, but don't necessarily value you know the staff that are doing the work and you know and that's often a you know a difficult place to be as a worker. Um, Somebody talked about the rest of those. Yeah. Can I ask Can often again kind of bring this back to a lawyer's frame which can sometimes be a bit more narrowly conceived than some of the stuff we're talking about now. Often we talk, talk about professional development being in the context of needing to get 10 CPD points and that kind of stuff. Just the more kind of what have been some of the professional development things that you guys have implemented that might not ordinarily be something that are offered to lawyers but we might conceive of here to help yeah. us in this part of our practice. Well, one of them was when Robin Brady spoke to us um, in October. You know, I think there's that, I can't remember how it's framed, but one of the compulsory CPD points is about um, being a lawyer, you know, learning to be a lawyer. Well, I put all that in that category because I think that um, it just goes to the essence of why we're there. If we don't look after ourselves, we can't look after our clients. Um, I think what we did with our admin staff, there's a course available somewhere called the Accidental Counselor. And so we got the people that answer the phone um, and, you know, that sort of that occasionally run, you know, have contact with clients, not so much in a professional sense, but in an accidental way. But, you know, as you're all aware, some clients just like to blurt and, and dump a whole lot of stuff on this. Some people that, you know, it comes out of left field and I think sort of it, it has to be for the whole, the people have to be able to do what they need to do and I think part of what we do in our staff meetings when we sort of check in and check out is, is to try and encourage people to articulate if anything's causing them concern or to give them an opportunity to say what's working or not working and then finding things that might sort of fill that gap or give them whatever support they need. Um, I came across the self-care wheel. Um, you, you know, there's so many tools out there um, and, you know, I think that it was just a reminder to me of, I guess, the different facets of how you look after yourself and I like the idea of the blank page and it's just, you know, fill it out as, as, as you would for yourself, you know, um, just to prompt, I guess. There's lots, there's lots of good resources and tools out there. Um, but, you know, I, I like to move, physically move. I find that really helps me. I've come to that quite late in my um, experience as a social worker. Um, I used to tell a lot of people that it was a good idea, but I didn't really <laughs> do it myself. And you know what? Surprise, surprise, it bloody works. And, um, you know, so I walk or I run. I run very slowly and badly, but that's what I do. But it helps me to, you know, I run my head more than my legs, really. And, you know, what I noticed is, you know, for example, we've been in running prison clinics the last few weeks and that's really, you know, I haven't been able to run, you know, in the same way I can't get out in the mornings and do that. And, you know, and you notice that. So it's just those things about, you know, just checking in around how you look after yourself and, you know, how you know. I, I think, you know, balance is a, is a um, tricky business and what feels like balance to you. <laughs> yeah. This is just the end, and I don't mean it's, I'm not, I don't intend to talk to those. But a couple of the things that one of the Robin Brady is a very funny woman and a superb speaker and very engaging. A tad sort of um, frenetic and high, but it's it's just it's really energising as opposed to sort of making you feel oh. She's just great. But one of the funny things she said to is the sense of humour and how important that is. And the example she gave was, if you were laughing six months ago and you aren't doing it now, you probably need a break. If you're laughing at everything, you definitely do. <laughs> um, so I think it's, you know, I, I think it's, and I think sort of planning your, not just your holidays, but planning your career or your life in a sense, it's good to have an exit plan. You know, and I think you, if, and you know, the bottom line basically is that, um, if it's not working for you and you can't do that, you don't have to stay. You know, you, you should go. It's not for everyone, and it's not for everyone indefinitely. And you know, I think we all get enriched by working in this sort of environment. But you know, it, it sort of has a limited lifespan. I think the reason I lasted so long at Women's is I only work two days a week. <laughs> yeah, and I think you know one of the things is that you know, like for our clients, they they don't have a choice. They have to you know, live with the life and the experiences that they've had. But we, you know, we do. We have a choice in working 
in that area and I really like that notion of being match fit and saying, you know, like I think for me, you know, I'll have worked the commission for the life of the commission as I'm sure others will, um, that feels about enough for me for now, you know, five years, that's, that's going to be about right. Has anyone got any questions or reflections that you'd like to sort of either put your hand up or, or type into James? I guess in particular, out there folks would be keen to hear about the practices that you have in your own community legal centre, where kind of practical steps that you might like to share to show how you've implemented and how you're making this stuff um, uh, very real. Um, Amanda, can I ask, um, just a couple of weeks ago, Dean and Warren, a couple of your colleagues, came in and spoke about um, the work that No More had done in providing culturally safe and secure um, services and uh, workplace and kind of in all of your work. And I wonder if there are kind of cultural elements to this trauma-informed practice and resilient lawyering stuff um, where you've learned from the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander staff who have got very sophisticated thinking about how to make the workplace culturally um, secure for them mm. um, and how it overlays and crosses over mm. or does it not? Oh, look, it absolutely does. I think um, one of the one of the things that is kind of impressive and also um, profoundly moving is um, what how connected Aboriginal people are as workers and as community members with intergenerational trauma, um, and 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 how. Um, but as a consequence of that, too, how able they are to also um, like beautifully support one another um, in a way that's very, um, there's a lot to learn from that. Um, also too though I guess about the profound impacts of, you know, not just doing the work, at the end of the day I can log the phones off at five o'clock and go home and, you know, they go home to community and the phone keeps ringing and, you know, so it's all these things all very well to talk about boundary setting and everything else like that but it's a whole different uh, context and, you know, incredibly generous with their culture and learnings. Um, I think one of the things that I've really learned, and, and I think it's, it, it's a bit large for all of us in, in our lives, but it's really been brought home to me is the how crucial the relationships are. And, you know, to work with an Indigenous community, the, you have to put in the hard yards to build a relationship with people at the community. You can't just come in and say, oh, here we are and we can do all this for you if you just you haven't done the hard work and you haven't done the groundwork to, to build those relationships. And you know, part of what we do and, and the, the fabulous work, of, the amazing work of our engagement team has been, you know, to to do that work but also then to vouch for us. Um, mm. And I think we've learned an enormous amount and, I, and I'm amazed that, you know, I think there are sometimes issues in relation to a uh, uh, not being like to be, you know, sort of having a Murray tell them how to, you know, or sort of to try and make those links. But I'm surprised how rarely that's come up in in, um, in our work. I think just the instinctive, um, you know, that we talked earlier about those trauma informed principles and, you know, safety, trust, choice, empowerment, and collaboration. And when you watch um, our engagement team work, that they do all of that instinctively, and it's it weaves through everything that they do yeah, and how they work absolutely. with community. A reminder, Faith, you can ask questions by typing a question into the question box or you can put up your hand and we can unmute your microphone. One of the questions that's come through, and I might paraphrase it a bit, um, there's a question about kind of what is the optimum size for um, a staff meeting and kind of group supervision and that kind of thing. But I guess you guys do it in very different stages in that you do kind of small team meetings across office teams or discipline teams. You do it one-on-one -on -one and you do it with the whole group across Australia. Um, but if we're in a CLC somewhere, what does good group supervision practice look like and how many people should be in the room and you know what kind of things should we be looking for there? Um, if I could speak to that just because um, in terms of you know a traditional sort of therapeutic group supervision process, I would say probably no more than eight to ten is about right. Um, that's if you are looking to have facilitated discussions about work. 
Um, that and that being said, it also depends on the nature of your work because a multidisciplinary supervision is going to look different again to you know maybe pulling together a discrete team of you know um, intake workers or you know whatever. So, but about eight to ten, you know, right? We we run a little larger than that sometimes, but we're around about that number as well. I think also yeah. that no more is a bit unusual in the CLC world in the sense that we have offices um, spread out over a number of cities. And, um, you know, so I think James got it in one in the sense we do a whole lot of levels and our um, twice yearly um, getting together is, is sort of so the lawyer group in that, I don't know how many of us are there, are probably 29, I think, lawyers. 20, yeah. yeah. Um, it, it, you know, that, that's quite a large group, but that sort of happens twice a year. But every you know, the last day of the month, all the lawyers will have a phone hookup. And I know that the support team have a regular... Uh, phone hookup and the engagement team have a regular phone hookup. We have our individual um, offices have their own sort of team meetings. You know, and I think you've just got to work out what works for your structure and what fills the need. But I think there has to be some way that at times you all get together and that you all work together. Otherwise, it sort of it becomes very siloed. Given that it's 4.58 and right now um, we don't have any more questions, um, can I, on behalf of the people who are clapping and cheering wildly at computers across the country, um, thank Amanda and Anne for that presentation. Um, this is vitally important for community legal centre workers. I think No More um, has a really sophisticated and thoughtful approach to this and I think it's something that we should all learn from um, given that there are so many um, similarities and crossovers um, across the CLC network um, and so much diversity at the same time. So it's really important to share these lessons. Thanks Anne and Amanda for doing that. Thank everyone for tuning in. We hope to have a recording of this made available and we'll send around another copy of the PowerPoint presentation and links to some resources. Um, I'm seeing some fantastic messages of thanks coming through GoToWebinar now. Um, so it's great to hear that you guys um, enjoyed and learned something from this as well. Look forward to speaking to you soon. Thanks, Thanks everyone. everyone.